we wanted to take the opportunity, well, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, Yagazi here with us to talk about the photos that you just shared in your experience. Thanks for sharing that with us. I was touched by what you said about moving or crossing that line from photojournalist to protester yourself. How did that change your work and what you saw through your lens? Normally, uh, the majority of my work is that I'm assigned by X, Y, and Z publications to go out and cover a story. And in my mind's eye, it's about, well, does this particular frame in suits what this publication would publish? And it was quite simple of, rather than thinking about what's with my work, Western publications would want to see. It was really about just documenting my community. And it took away the sort of expectations that I normally place on myself while normally on an assignment. It made me more intimate with people. It made me unafraid um, just to go closer to them. Um, because sometimes with work, there is a performance element. Mm -hmm. And I was there by myself. And without someone telling me what to do, that element was removed. So I think it created more of images that I would say were for the protesters more than anything. How did you decide what to focus your lens on? These were protests that were diffused, they were all over the city. Oh, I, di I didn't, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I usually don't plan when I go into spaces because it's, it's really not safe to build expectations around something as volatile as, as that. Anything could change. So for me, it's always important to go in with an open mind and and see what there is to see. With going around the different locations, I just felt that you have locations on Lagos Island, which is more of the upscale part of Nigeria and of Lagos, and then you have the mainland. And I really wanted to make sure to cover as much as possible as I could on that, so it was important to go through these different class demographics across Lagos as well, very strategically with that. You've said that sometimes when you get so invested in a story, you forget that you're a visitor. But you also know Lagos so well. You grew up there as well. So how is that interplay between being a visitor and a local in some way? Well, I've spent most of my adult life in Lagos, but I unfortunately did not grow up there. Um, I grew up in a much smaller town, and Lagos was my first time experience of a proper African city. Um, so, and it's also a as a country that is very much focused on ethnicities and ethnic groups, it's a very much a Yoruba state. So when I came from the southeast home that I am, where it's predominantly Igbo, I came to a place where a lot of the cultures were completely new and foreign to me. So a lot of the times when I'm covering Lagos, I'm very much aware that someone will go and say, you don't look Yoruba, or you look as if you're from this place. Um, and that's always a reminder that I am a visitor in these spaces, and I do have to um, tread cautiously um, with a lot of respect and consideration, as opposed to the NSAS protests where we were all together as one. You know, everybody's checking on each other. It's all of our issues. It's a public space. We have every right to be in these spaces, so that definitely helps. Through the work that you just showed us, what message were you sending about the socio-political state of Nigeria right now? It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, going out, I, I didn't have, and in the aftermath of the NSARS, I did have a lot of people like approaching me with questions and whatnot, and I'll, about like, oh, well, what do you think about this, and what do you think about that? And for me, that was, I will be frank with you, it was not my intention. You know, my intention was just to go out and document my community. The issues in Nigeria have been painfully apparent for years unfortunately. And in the aftermath of what followed with NSARS and now following along with um, families and their homes and what happened with the police officers that inflicted this pain on these families and the general bad governance, um, unfortunately, there's nothing positive I can say about what I want to you know, pass on to people. Um, I, have a, I can only say to answer your question, and not very directly, I'm afraid, is I truly do not have any faith in the Nigerian government. But what I do have is a lot of hope for Nigerians themselves. Um, but unfortunately, the rot is just way too deep for me to say, like, this is kind of what I want people to see, because I think it's also very apparent.
It sounds like the protests also presented <clears throat> a silver lining, a positive note that you could take away from what you were witnessing. And you said that it was always women and girls who were at the forefront. And you actually focus a lot of your work on women and girls. Yes. Why is that? What is it there that you see in particular? It's always an interesting question because to me it's like, what's there not to see? You know, I don't think, you know, any white photographer would get questioned as to why he photo photographs white men. Hmm. You know, there's this, it's, a rele it's relevant. It's simply put, it's always been relevant and there isn't enough of it. So why not do more of it? How does that come across in the publications you work for usually? Hmm. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to be in a position where I can actually pick and choose the stories I want to work with, uh, want to work on. Um, so it's not so much being assigned and taking on anything. I'm very particular about the stories I take on, be it around um, social issues in Nigeria and in particular being approached um, to cover stories on women and girls. Not everyone here might know, but you're actually a self-taught photographer. Yes. How did that come about? Pure survival <laughs> and necessity. I was, um, I had moved to Lagos with a plan to actually produce a television show around African women and sexuality and make it more of an open topic. And plan after plan, it all failed. But in the meantime, I'd just been taking pictures on my phone and posted them on social <coughs> media. And my sibling was like, you know, why don't you try doing this professionally? And I think we've all been at that stage professionally where we're like, am I good enough? Can I actually do this? Um, so I took that jump and in 2016, I would say, is when I really started playing around with the camera. How is your work, because we are for focusing in this conference on the metropolis, how has Lagos and have other cities where you've worked at seen as well inspired what you see? Hmm. Inspire what I see. Um, it's more of... Yeah. I don't know. I think... Being someone who has, you know, spent my other formative years in the States, and I think I left home too early, I was hit by this, and I had a terrible, terrible time assimilating. Um, I was always hit by this feeling of, like, nostalgia and um, being homesick. And I remember when the first time I came to Lagos, and it wasn't my hometown, but there were all these scenes, it could be smells, it could be something that reminded me of my hometown. And I think a lot of my work is me kind of following those, I don't know if it makes sense, but it's more of me following those memories. So it can be a smell that can, I can be in the middle, I remember I was in the middle of West Point in Liberia and it was really stuffy and uncomfortable and I got a whiff of something and I was like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of home, you know? And it made me just kind of like, you know, sit down on the floor and enter a conversation with people. And I think that is, that is the inspiration I get everywhere is I'm kind of like walking like this and following my nose around mm -hmm. these places because they remind me of home and I want to show more of it. So it's really about these cities and these spaces, especially African countries where we are more alike than we are different, even with our huge um, diversity. Um, it's something that just makes me feel at home. <laughs> um, and that is what inspires me to just keep on sharing it because I do think that a, I, don't, I don't photograph for a Western audience, um, ironically, even though I do work for them, <laughs> but I photograph so that people, we can see ourselves as neighbors. We can see elements of ourselves and these images that connect us. So that's really what inspires me. It's more of the other way of the, in, the cities inspire me to create the work that I, I do. I do want to open the opportunity because we have such a, a large captive audience here. If anybody does have a question for Yagazi, we can't actually pass around microphones due to COVID restrictions, but you could repeat it here into the room and I can repeat it on the microphone so that everyone on our live stream can hear it. So if anybody has a question, I can keep asking. Oh, there's one here if you would like to share it with us. I'll just repeat the question for our stream. So the, the, con the reason for the continued police brutality, which you covered in your work? Just corruption. 
it is it's just as simple as that. And unfortunately, corruption is not simple, um, especially on a state governmental level. I don't fully understand it. But what I have seen from my work is a chief of police getting away with murders and the governor actually supporting him because he's collecting money from the body parts that they are selling, you know, as they kill these individuals. And then someone else is protecting the governor. And the second I came across something like that, I was just like, I, that's why I say I, I give up on, <laughs> I give up on having hope in our, um, on that level in the government because the rut is just far too embedded into our culture um, where the officers can get away with, you know, being poorly paid as well, being poorly trained. This is a global issue as well when you look at all police issues around the world. Who are you giving the gun to? What kind of person are you empowering? Um, and then you have all the other issues um, around just poor governance and greed that completely infiltrates and deteriorates what a system is supposed to be and it completely fails. It's just corruption. Any further questions? There is one here as well. Sure, get closer and I'll repeat your question as well. So, uh, more like in a global scale, because there are like these protests happening in other countries as well, like from Chile, like from Colombia, Hong Kong. So, do you have like a global perspective of what is happening in terms of metropolis? From your perspective, like this is happening in so many places right now, like what, what do you think here is happening? I'll repeat that. There, is there a global connection between some of the protests that we're seeing in other countries as well and what you witness in Lagos? What do I, sorry? Well, and what you witness in Lagos. Is there, there's a connection that you the see? The global connection is also, first of all, the youth. You have an entirely different generation who have grown up under different circumstances but genuinely want change. Um, the connection also is technology. I, I really want to believe that where a lot of these issues have always been happening, but with technology, we're just seeing more and more of it. You know, how people are now able to mobilize, you know, it, the NSAS movement wasn't just the only one that utilized social media to mobilize these protests. So I think those would be the first two connect, connecting points on a global level. Absolutely. I think I'll just ask one last question because that's really what we'll have time for. Is there one image that you took that stuck with you from what you witnessed or a series of images that you took? Probably the lady with the flag that I ended it on. Um, the, the NSAS protests, even though they were organized, you know, they, they weren't perfect, I'll, I'll say that. You know, there were still issues in it. There were women being bullied. There were members of the queer community being told to get out, you know. Um, so within the protest, there's still another problematic community within that. Um, but the lady with the flag, I remember, she, the flag is heavy. And she was just walking nonstop, marching, 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 marching. And not once did her hand go down. And people were like saying, sister, can I help you? And she was just like, absolutely not. And she didn't want to talk to people. She was just marching along. And that sort of resilience, you know, and in a way, it was also scary but in an admirable way where I was just like, I don't want to disturb. <laughs> you know, I was even hesitant to take a photo of her because I was standing in front of her and I had to run out again. Um, but that photo to me really speaks of the resilience of the Nigerian youth. Yes, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, but it, we're starting somewhere, I think. And that level of just being able to come together, not just in Lagos, but throughout the country, and really shake up the Nigerian government where they are genuinely afraid and bothered by young Nigerian men and women just fighting, you know, peacefully for their rights. I think it's just that image that's going to keep on reminding me of the NSARS movement. Yagasi, yeah, thank you for sharing your work and your conversation with us.